Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today's guest is a renowned attorney who became a household name on season two of the Netflix blockbuster series, Making a Murderer. She's dedicated her career to seeking justice for those who were wrongfully arrested or convicted and whose civil rights were violated. She's achieved 20 exonerations for wrongfully convicted clients and she consistently wins record-breaking damage awards. She's won dozens of accolades and awards, including the American Bar Association Pursuit of Justice Award, the Ron Perlman Outstanding Service Award by the Litigation Council of America, and the Illinois State Crime Commission Champion of Justice Award. She's consistently named on the list of top trial lawyers, and the Chicago Tribune named her one of the most influential women in America. I'm delighted and truly honored to welcome Kathleen Zellner to our show. Kathleen, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Kathleen, as you know, our show is filmed in Canada, and I see that you went to Concordia University in Montreal. You're from Texas. You moved to Oklahoma as a child. You went to university in Wisconsin and then Missouri. What took you to Montreal? My husband was doing a postdoctoral fellowship, and I was planning to go to law school at McGill. I had gotten into that joint program, the French and English program, and then he had a job offer back in the States, and so we left. But we actually, we love Canada. We thought about just staying permanently. I'm sorry you didn't stay because we would have loved to have you be a lawyer here. Yes. <laughs> Kathleen, as you know, the vast majority of lawyers specialize in one area of law, but you have the rare distinction of having won major verdicts in criminal and civil cases, including medical malpractice. How in the world do you keep on top of all those areas of law and procedure? Well, I think, you know, I did them in sequence. So I started out doing the med mal defense for doctors. And then when I started my own firm, I switched to plaintiff's medical malpractice. But at the same time, I started working on wrongful conviction cases. So I, I was working on, you know, those areas of law at the same time. But I think it helped me because I understood that the civil litigation process, in addition to the criminal litigation process, which are both quite different. Do you think that having expertise in civil litigation makes you a better criminal lawyer? Oh, absolutely. Because I was so familiar with working with experts. You know, all med mal cases are won by expert opinion and testimony. And so I was extremely comfortable with working with doctors that was easy to transition to other scientists. And I think that's an area in criminal law that's very neglected. Because of the, the scarcity of resources, many defendants simply don't have a proper presentation of their case forensically. And a lot of times that's the key to success. And so, yes, that's helped me tremendously having that background. Another unique thing about you is that you do trials and appeals, which is rather unusual, isn't it? I think that it is. I started as an appellate clerk, so that was my training, and I envisioned being an appellate attorney, but once I set foot in a courtroom, I found doing trials really exhilarating and thought, you know, the, the appellate process is interesting, but my real heart, my heart was in doing litigation at the trial level. I love doing jury trials. I can just imagine. <laughs> what inspired you to focus your law practice on seeking justice for wrongfully convicted people? Well, it started out kind of, you wouldn't have expected a good prognosis because I was, I had some clerks that were finishing law school and they wanted me to take a death penalty case because they thought it would be interesting. It would be complex and interesting. So we jumped in and got appointed on a death penalty case, but the client was a suspected serial killer. And so that took us down, you know, a long road with a lot of interesting legal issues, conflict of interest with this trial attorney having received payment from the key prosecution witness. It was just full of issues. But I also realized that my client was guilty of, you know, many other murders. And, and he, upon his death, he had given me permission to release confessions to other murders. The place that allowed me to be appointed, it was a federally funded organization. 
They called back and wanted me to take a second death penalty case because they liked the way I investigated cases. But they told me that this individual was innocent. And it turned out to be Joseph Burroughs. And it was one of the first cases in the world of, of someone being exonerated from the death penalty. So that really changed my focus, I think, of what I wanted to do. I kept doing the civil trials, but when I would compare, you know, multi-million dollar verdicts with saving someone's life, there really wasn't a comparison. So, you know, now I would say we're probably 90% focused on wrongful convictions. Is there one particular reason that accounts for an innocent person being convicted? I think the single biggest reason that an innocent person is convicted is that a prosecutor is willing to, I, I think, willing to bend the rules, willing to do things that are unethical to secure that conviction, whether it's withholding evidence, fabrication of evidence. It's, it's a mindset on the part of prosecutors that causes uh, wrongful convictions. I, I was just consulted on a case today from Pennsylvania where the prosecutor who's now deceased is responsible for probably six to 12 wrongful convictions. There was a pattern. It's the same thing we used to see in medical malpractice. 5% of the doctors committed all of the malpractice. And I think this is true of, of corrupt prosecutors, but that's where I think it it starts, the police really are dependent upon the prosecutor to carry forward with charges that you know, may be based on evidence that's withheld, fabricated. They're working in conjunction, but ultimately the decision is made by the prosecutor. Are there certain personality traits that you have to have in order to be an effective litigation lawyer? Yes, I think there's a level of tenacity and aggression, but I think part of the problem is that there are attorneys that are simply not motivated by trying to find the truth or seek justice. They just have, you know, very aggressive personalities, and they can be quite effective in a courtroom on cross-examination. But I think a lot of times cross-examination is used more as an abusive tactic than trying to get to the truth. I always tell my attorneys, we can't win the case on cross-examination. We have to have substantive evidence that proves innocence. When you're defending an innocent man or woman, it's not the same as just getting up and talking about reasonable doubt. You've got, you've got to be much more aggressive in trying to point to who the real killer is because Juries want solutions. They want to think someone's being held accountable. I often think that young lawyers are influenced by the lawyers they see on television. And that's where they seem to develop their cross-examination skills or lack thereof. Yes. I absolutely think that young lawyers are influenced by television cross-examiners. And I see them in court. And usually... It's, it's somewhat humorous because they'll usually dig a very deep hole because if you get a sympathetic witness and you're just attacking them, juries do not like that kind of lack of decorum, lack of respect, and it backfires. Does it ever. Now, you're known for using creative trial strategies in your litigation. What do you think sets you apart from other trial lawyers? I think... In the criminal arena, it's because I think that you must reconstruct, you must reconstruct the state's case to demonstrate to the jury that it's physically impossible, that it's scientifically impossible. But over the years, even in my medical malpractice cases, I've resorted to a lot of recreation techniques. You can explain things verbally, but but it's so much more effective to demonstrate it visually. I think that's a huge thing that separates attorneys, you know, the, and a lot of the very effective prosecutors are able to reenact things for the jury. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Uh, one of your most spectacular successes is the Kevin Fox case. He was wrongfully convicted of killing his three-year-old daughter. 
you described that case as exhilarating and traumatic. What made that case stand out among all of your successes? What made Kevin Fox's case stand out is that we were, we were you know, dealing with the death of a child, traumatic death, sexual assault of a three-year-old, and then the father being blamed for it. And I always try to really understand my clients, understand their life story, get a sense of who they are, because I'm going to be the spokesperson to the jury. And I knew very quickly that Kevin Fox was a wonderful father and that he had been so traumatized by the death of his child. And then he was not an aggressive personality, not an egotistical personality. And I think he was just crushed by the accusations. And then he'd not been allowed to grieve over the death of his child. And so that made it very traumatic because they were seeking the death penalty and the, and the little girl had been submerged in water and we did not know if there would be any DNA. And we were so fortunate that the pathologist took swabs, vaginal swabs, and there was saliva and there were just enough loci that we could eliminate Kevin Fox because it saved his life. But I felt like his life was just hanging in the balance and I'd gotten very close to the family. I was living their nightmare with them as it progressed, but it, it made the civil rights case very powerful because I'd been in on it from the beginning representing them. And so I knew the case so well, and I had the emotional commitment and, and sense of injustice of what had happened to them. And I think it's still the largest verdict in the United States per month and that was and then they subsequently caught the killer so at the time we did the trial i was telling the jury you know i knew how the killer had entered the house how he picked the child up but we did not know who the killer was and then they eventually caught the real killer which is an incredible uh, icing on the cake of the victory yes that was the most important thing in the parents mind i think that for them the civil trial was one of vindication of putting the detectives on trial who'd been really so cruel to them, you know, and, and they wanted, it, it really never had to do with the money. It just had to do with feeling like their story was being heard. I know before the trial, he, Kevin Fox had been in a jail for eight months, which would be considered a relatively small amount of time. So we were offered $3 million on the eve of trial. And he told me, which, which would be a really large sum of money, uh, particularly at that time for eight months of incarceration. He told me, he said, I don't care if we win 25 cents. I want to have my day in court. And so we walked out of that mediation, which was literally 24 hours before the trial started and just said, no, we don't want your money. So it was just, I mean, it was an incredible risk, but it was so worth it, you know, because we all felt the same way. We have to, there has to be a public record of what happened to them. The Kevin Fox case stretched out for over five years, and it was an arduous battle to say the least. Kathleen, are there times when you feel like giving up because victory seems impossible? There I've never felt like giving up, but I felt, you know, like I, I think real grief at times about how the system works, that it just puts people through such difficulty. You know, I think the Kevin Fox case was, was one of those cases. Thank goodness we had an ethical prosecutor who was elected right you know, while the criminal case was pending. And when we got the DNA, he released Kevin the next day. But it, it was a long, long, difficult journey. And there are definitely times, I mean, I remember thinking in the Ryan Ferguson case, you know, if they don't let him go, given that the only two witnesses in the trial against him had admitted committing perjury, despite the fact they faced life sentences in Missouri, I thought, you know, I just feel like tearing up my law license. Like mm -hmm. if, if we cannot get 
these judges to listen. And of course, the courts are just notorious for being tone deaf about actual innocence. You know, the, the conviction integrity units in these prosecution offices now are responsible for releasing more people even than the Innocence Project. But when you look at these cases and the history as they wind their way through the court system, there are very few judges that really recognize innocence when they see it. Most of them just affirm convictions. You know, we've had them where somebody will come to us after it's been affirmed in the state court system, the federal court system. You know, these judges have written these opinions about how they're clearly guilty. And then we get a DNA exoneration. So, you know, these judges, just many of them just have no sense of, you know, the fact that they're innocent people who've been framed. These kinds of cases are real endurance contests, aren't they? Yes, they're in, that's exactly what they are. They are endurance contests. In fact, they're, I think it was Brendan Garrett at the University of Virginia who wrote the book, Convicting the Innocent. And that's what he talked about. It's the people who don't give up. They'll fight their way through the state system, go through the federal system, come back to the state system. And I think the average length of time was 15 years post-conviction for people to, you know, be exonerated. So when you're asked to take on a wrongful conviction case, do you go through a process to satisfy yourself that the person really is innocent before you agree to take the case? Yes. Yes. We actually, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an immediate scenario of a case that came to us today that I feel strongly that the person's innocent. The conviction is 40 years old. It was the prosecutor on the case who's now deceased has had six to, I think, a dozen convictions overturned. There, the, there's fabrication of the police reports that you, you can demonstrate there is fabrication. And then there was blood evidence that's now been determined not to have been blood at all, much less the defendant's blood. So it's got, this case has huge errors in it, you know, and it's bounced around in state court. Now it's in federal court and it's just sat on a habeas for 10 years. But there's a new prosecutor who's been going back reviewing cases, looking for errors. And he's indicating that he has strong interest in discussing the case. But yes, so we, we have a process because if you don't, you, you waste a lot of time on people that are guilty. Now, I know that they have you know, constitutional rights too, and there are lots of attorneys out there to defend them, but I'm not one of them. I, I'm continuing to look for the people that are innocent, that have been victimized. And I think we're pretty skilled because we, I mean, one of the hallmarks is, does the person, are they receptive to forensic testing? Because someone who's guilty is not going to be. And do they indicate, when, and they usually write to us, that they're willing to, you know, subject themselves to any type of testing. Uh, they want evidence retested. There, there are certain clear markers that someone is innocent. The other thing that we've noticed, and it's very consistent, that people, when they're innocent, no matter what type of plea deal is offered to them, will not take it. So I'll give you a current example. We have a case that's set for trial. I'm hoping the charges get dismissed on it. But when I became the attorney on it just a few months ago, so it got reversed by the Illinois Supreme Court, the murder conviction got reversed, came back for a second trial. We brought in experts. I think we've shown that it's not even a murder case, that this woman died of natural causes. The prosecutor who'd done the first trial made an opening offer to me of involuntary manslaughter for time served. Now, this is someone who spent seven years in prison on a 26-year sentence for first-degree murder, and he's reducing it to involuntary manslaughter once he sees the expert reports and that my client can walk out the door that day. So just to test my theory, I just presented it to the client, which of course I'd be obligated to do, but without reacting either way. And he said to me, 
I wouldn't plead guilty to jaywalking. And that's always, that's consistently what I've, and I know some people get forced to plead guilty. They have poor representation and they are innocent, but it's after someone has served a lot of time and an approach is made to them to plead guilty. We have not yet had a client that would agree to that. So even though it meant staying in custody until the hearing. Yes, absolutely. Now you're well known for the high damage awards you've won for your wrongfully convicted clients. You got $15.5 million for Kevin Fox, $11 million for Ryan Ferguson, $9 million for Ray Spencer, just to name a few. What do you think is the key to convincing a jury to be generous in damage awards? I think what you have to do, it's really the client that does that. So the client has to be able to explain and articulate what it's like to be innocent and imprisoned in an American prison. And I think those clients, if we use that sample, now Kevin Fox wasn't in as long, but he was able to articulate, he kept a diary. And during the federal trial, he read parts of the diary, you know, about missing his wife and his son. And it was gut-wrenching Ryan Ferguson was extremely articulate about explaining, you know, he went into prison as a relatively skinny young man, 140 pounds, and his father told him, you are going to have to become stronger, faster. And so he really exercised and and built himself up because he was terrified. And so he explained that uh, we did a bench trial on that case. Ray Spencer was a former police officer accused of molesting his children. So he was a target and he had to fight almost every day that he was in there. And he, he was one of them, cause he ended up getting a PhD in psychology. He was one of the most articulate plaintiffs that I've ever put on the stand to describe prison. That's the key to it because you've got to take the jury into a world that you know, they've got some idea of watching television, but they don't have any idea of the reality of it. When someone who's been wrongfully convicted finally has their conviction reversed, do you think they ever feel truly exonerated in the public eye? In the, so does an exonerated person feel that the public believes that they're innocent? Yeah. That's a really good question because I have been astounded how many people, particularly with Kevin Fox, if you have a false confession, then you have a DNA exoneration, then the real killer is caught. You would think that no one would question your innocence, but people do. Really? Yes. And I find that just, I find it really still, even at this point, shocking. It's jaw dropping. It is. It's just, It just makes you wonder about humanity. Like it's just so malicious, I think, that kind of thinking. But you're absolutely right that I think once you have that taint, it's it's almost impossible to ever feel like you're just totally vindicated. Because people, it's it's very strange to me, but people want to think, well, you were probably involved at some level, you know. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, you were prominently featured as Stephen Avery's lawyer in season two of Making a Murderer. Did you have any hesitation about allowing a film crew to follow you around? I mean, there must have been some risks involved. I did. I did feel with the particular creators and producers, one of them is a lawyer, uh, Laura Ricciardi, that they were so ethical. They never let me know what they were thinking. They'd just be super prepared for the interviews. They'd film. And I felt like, you know, I mean, it took a while to trust them, but I did feel that they were sincerely interested in getting at the truth, but they never really shared what they were thinking as as we were filming. But yes, I had to weigh the fact that the case was already so well known You know, it had been filmed, the trial had been filmed. I felt really confident with him that he was innocent. 
he subjected himself to all kinds of testing, much more sophisticated than polygraphing. He was willing to do anything. So as I became more convinced of his innocence, I mean, totally convinced of it, then I was less wary. And as I, as I got to know the, the producers, the creators of it, I felt that their goals, their intentions were honorable. So, you know, I was, I was trusting uh, of them. I know that there were hundreds of hours of filming and what we ended up seeing was highly edited, but were you happy, Kathleen, with how you and your work were portrayed in that series? Yes, I mean, there were, as you pointed out, I mean, there were many hours of filming just of the nature of a series that you have to edit. But I thought it was as objective as it could possibly have been. I mean, they were showing both sides of the story, they could get no cooperation from the prosecutors, so, but they were, you know, continuously showing their arguments at the trial, statements that they had made. I mean, you know, I thought it was an amazing job giving the, given the lack of cooperation that they had from the prosecutors. Now, the legal issues in the Stephen Avery case include allegations of ineffective trial counsel the planting of evidence by the killer and the police, ethical violations and false testimony by law enforcement officials. Despite all your efforts, Stephen Avery remains in jail. Do you have any confidence that he will ever be exonerated? Well, I think as you pointed out earlier, that you must never give up and you must be persistent. I think we have just created huge holes in the prosecution case with the experts that I brought in. And I think that it's I actually have a theory about why they have resisted an evidentiary hearing so strongly. We were reviewing 30 years of our cases and we believe in 98 to 99% of our, our post-conviction cases, we've always been given an evidentiary hearing even if the court ultimately rules against us, they want to have witnesses cross-examined, they want to have a presentation of the evidence, then they might rule against you. I mean, that happened to us in Ryan Ferguson's case, and then the appellate court reversed it outright. But they always want you to come and present the evidence. So, and, and the trial attorneys, Stephen's trial attorneys, actually have been very cooperative with me. They've given me affidavits, they've said, you know, it would have been better if we'd had some of these experts. There's a huge Brady violation in the case. But the court, courts, trial and appellate, and I suspect Supreme Court, do not want me or my legal team to darken the door of a, a courtroom. And I thought, what, why is that? Why don't they want us to do that? So at first I thought, well, you know, it's obvious they don't want these things coming out. And, you know, they know of, of our reputation, my reputation. But then I thought, no, this is different. It's something else. And I'll tell you what I've concluded. I've concluded it's because they do not want a third series of Making a Murder made because millions and millions of people watch that show. It probably rivals the Super Bowl. The, if we have an evidentiary hearing, which is in Illinois, We've gotten an evidentiary hearing for a serial killer, you know, someone. So it is because the evidentiary hearing would have to be public and there'd be cameras and these witnesses would be subjected to cross-examination, particularly the person that we think is responsible for the crime. And they do not want to subject themselves to that again. When Brendan Dassey got his evidentiary hearing, it was five years before Making a Murder One was made, the first series. So I thought that's the only distinguishing characteristic of why they are, as Jerry Buting said, phobic about letting us back in a courtroom when we have these you know, nationally and internationally renowned experts. It's so fascinating. That's a very interesting comment you just made, because I have to tell you, and I know you were not involved in season one, but every criminal lawyer 
that I know has told me that had they been Stephen Avery's counsel, they would never have advised him to participate in a Netflix TV series while his case was still alive because the courts are uh, phobic about this kind of high profile, this kind of being under a microscope and in a fishbowl regarding yes. not just the case, but the whole process and culture of the criminal justice system. You're right. I think you're absolutely right. And that, you know, the, the producers, the creators of it came in and just started filming, you know, the courtroom scenes, but then, you know, they got the rights of the family members and, and then the attorneys were giving interviews and right. So by the time I had inherited the case, it was like, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> the, the, you're now in a situation where there's this, you know, all of these issues have been raised and there's this huge audience, you know, trying to get answers. But, but I think you're right that the, the actual judicial system, even though they let trials be filmed, they actually are extraordinarily uncomfortable with it. It doesn't happen in Canada, Kathleen. <laughs> what never used to happen it still happens extremely rarely in illinois you know i with the cases i had before we had cases across the country we just never had cameras in a courtroom you know you might walk out and there'd be news people after the case was over or if someone would be exonerated you'd give a press conference but you know well when you look at the caliber of legal representation that Stephen Avery got at his trial, it's obvious that his lawyers, they didn't do much of an investigation. They didn't get no. the expert witnesses that were required to properly defend him. Did that shock you? Yes. Yes. And, and I really confronted them with it and they admitted, I mean, they were wrong about the blood theory, about the blood coming from the vial. You know, they should have they never got an EDTA expert. I got one. We learned the blood had not come from the vial. Stephen Avery had told them about the blood in his sink. There was still blood there. I mean, that was verifiable. Yeah, they had no blood expert, no ballistics expert, no DNA expert, no trace expert. And they got money because he settled his civil suit. I mean, compared to the average criminal defense attorney, they got close to $300,000. And they only had one really credible expert. Even he wasn't that great. So yeah, they really dropped the ball. The other huge thing was they had right in their possession, I have an affidavit from their investigator who's deceased now, that he totally missed the fact that Bobby Dassey's older brother had given a police report where he'd reported that Bobby told him he saw her leave the property. So they should have known that the state star witness was lying and they were desperately trying to connect people on a third party suspect, you know, so they missed that. They, you know, they, they just really botched all of that, I think. As far as you know, has there ever been a person who was wrongfully convicted twice? No. Well, no. in all the research I've done about the Stephen Avery case, I get the sense that you're not only 100% convinced that he's innocent, you're 100% sure of who the real killer is. Am I right? I am. Yes. Well, I'm yes. not going to ask you to identify the person, but anyone who watched the show carefully should be able to figure it out. All I'm going to say is that sometimes a key witness turns out to be the perpetrator. Is that right? Absolutely. There is a history in the United States, and I'm sure probably in other countries, the state's star witness will be the perpetrator. How is Stephen Avery doing these days? He's a very resilient person. He was tested in a study that was done for PTSD. And although, you know, it verified that he's got post-traumatic stress, it also verified that he's one of those people that as a result of that is, is really stronger or more resilient. But Oh, he's a thriver. He thrives on it. Yes. But I also see, you know, his deterioration 
you know, he's lost his mother. His oh. father is, you know, was there last week and is, is pretty infirm. It's hard to keep going, you know. It's hard to have a purpose when you just keep trying and it just keeps falling flat, you know. Do you think there will be a season three of Making a Murderer? I think there very well could be if, you know, we're able to get, if they let us back in a courtroom, you know, if they continue to try to block us, then it's going to require, and, you know, I always say you never want to give up. It's going to require that we have even more evidence against the perpetrator. And by that, I mean that someone close, you know, there's a reward offer that's been posted by a businessman anonymously, but it's legitimate of $100,000 for evidence leading to the rest of the real killer. It's going to take that. It's going to take someone else who knows, a wife, a girlfriend. We had a case here in Illinois, the Brown's chicken murder, where seven people were killed 12 years after that event, the ex-girlfriends came forward. So there's someone else who knows, and we know that there's another individual, we don't know how involved he was, but he helped move the car back onto the property. Someone, I think, will eventually come forward, and then that will be completely new evidence of actual innocence. It's not going to be bogged down in a lot of the procedural rules you know, that bar, you know, subsequent post-convictions or in habeas. Actual innocence can really stand on its own in most state courts. Now, it was very clear, Kathleen, from watching Making a Murderer, that your work takes a lot out of you, both professionally and personally, because the stakes are so high. How are you doing, Kathleen, in handling the emotional impact of these cases that you take on? Well, it's interesting because I can, you know, I can have something like Stephen Avery where the outcome at this point is very disappointing, but then I'll have another case where it's working perfectly and I know that somebody's going to be released because of our efforts. So I can draw energy from that to, to keep going on his case. But you're right, you have to, you know, I've been, I used to say, you know, to my friends, to my husband, I'll never do another one of these. It's just too draining, you know? But then like today, someone calls me and <laughs> next thing I know, you know, I'm thinking this person's been in for 40 years. We've got a receptive prosecutor. Why can't I do this one more time, you know? You're amazing. And I know you have a daughter. I have to wonder, how did you manage to raise a child with the incredible <laughs> workload that you took on? Well, she, she is a lawyer. She's a, a corporate lawyer. She actually works for a big energy company now, and she's head of their litigation department in Colorado. But she worked for me. And so she was involved. Her first trial was the Kevin Fox trial. She was like the third chair. We let her do a couple of the witnesses. So she was in it with me, you know, emotionally too, but yeah, I just, you know, I came from a family of seven children. My mother worked until she was 82 as a nurse. My wow. father was a geologist. So they just had this incredible work ethic. I've been blessed with a lot of energy. I've just got, you know, a lot of energy. And the exhilaration and the satisfaction of prevailing on one of these cases is what sustains you when you're in the middle of it. You think, well, I keep telling myself, well, just one more time you know? Well, so. you know, Kathleen, when I watched Making a Murderer, it really hit me in a very gut-wrenching way that the criminal justice system makes absolutely no sense to the average person. And it upsets me. Does it bother you too? Yes. Yes. And is that because a lot of it doesn't make sense? That they're, you know, we're very skilled at just getting guilty pleas. And many people are guilty. But how can you have such a difficult system set up for people that are innocent? Why does it take so many years to get somebody out? 
in your opinion, has the criminal justice system, especially the rules of evidence and procedure, have they kept up with new developments in forensics and DNA? Not really, no. no. I mean, you know, there have been states that have actual innocence standards and, you know, everyone's, now the states have DNA statutes. But, you know, the prosecutors have come back even with the DNA evidence trying to say, well, that's not really exculpatory. It's just this endless adversarial process. And the only rays of hope I've seen are with more progressive prosecutors, like there's one in Texas, in Houston, uh, Kim Ogg, or here, James Glasgow, or, you know, in some of these other states, it's those individuals that have the power to dismiss charges. And so the solutions to many of these cases do not occur in a courtroom. The court, that's the last, you know, you go in and enter a dismissal order. All of the work and the collaboration has been done with prosecutors working with defense attorneys when the prosecutors are willing to acknowledge that mistakes have been made. What do you think of the doctrine of immunity for police and prosecutors? It's a very bad thing. When you don't, I mean, absolute immunity is terrible, but qualified immunity is too. I mean, no one else has that in their job. And when you are not holding individuals accountable, like we've noticed even in the cases where we've gotten large civil verdicts, the police insurance pays that money and the officers very rarely have been disciplined. They go right back to work, and in some cases, they've been promoted. So there's a failure of the system to hold those people accountable. Now, we're seeing with the police brutality cases some accountability, you know, where people or where officers are being charged with murder, but that's very new. And yeah, it's a terrible doctrine, qualified immunity. I'm a big believer in mentoring of young lawyers because I don't think that law school sufficiently prepares lawyers for the real world of practicing law. Did did you have good mentors when you were starting out? I think that I did. I think the judge that I worked for was a great mentor when I started. And then I think the individuals that I met, you know, that I was working for, I learned a tremendous amount from them about how to prepare for trial But I think it would be better if we had a combination of, in law schools, of classroom study, but then you actually were assigned to a lawyer because that's, I mean, I've gotten so many wonderful ideas and such great work from my young lawyers and clerks, law clerks. They're the best. And, you know, they're in these real life situations with me and they rise to the occasion that's what makes a great lawyer. It's, it's not sitting in a courtroom or sitting in a classroom. And, and many of the people teaching in law schools don't have any practical experience. And then the ones of us that are out there in the trenches don't have time to be teaching. So I'm really doing it through the people I hire. You know, Boy, I are they in. lucky. Are they lucky. <laughs> what advice do you have for young lawyers hoping to follow in your footsteps in correcting miscarriages of justice? I think to really believe that you can do it as a young lawyer. I mean, Jerry Spence, you know, the famous American lawyer, I think he's probably 90 now, but he's one of the greatest trial attorneys ever in the United States, said, I don't fear the attorney from the big firm. I fear the young woman or young man right out of law school that passionately believes in their client. He said, that's what I fear in front of a jury. And so, you know, I think, that you have to experience. I mean, I I found the experience I had clerking, working for a large firm, being trained to do litigation. I found that invaluable, but then I made the decision, I'm going to do something on my own. I know what kind of cases I want and I I know who I am. I know what I want to pursue. So it would be great. I think if there were a lot more lawyers that were entrepreneurial, you know, that you don't just stick with the big firm past the train training phase And you pursue what you really care about, what actually matters to you. Oh, absolutely. And I think that working with judges probably made you a better litigation lawyer. Absolutely, because I worked for a wonderful judge. And, you know, I, I think that was absolutely pivotal in my career was having that experience right out of law school. 
Now, Kathleen, as you know, I've spent the last 40 years of my life in a courtroom, first as a lawyer and the last 26 years as a judge. So I cannot resist asking you this question. What advice do you have for trial judges? I think trial judges have to really work at setting aside first impressions or biases. I think they have to consider that they, in making the evidentiary rulings, I think it's very important that juries hear most of the evidence. I think micromanaging the evidence in a trial is ultimately self-defeating. Yes, you know, sometimes there's hearsay, there's lots of exceptions to it, but they have to be, they, they have to have the primary goal to be truth seekers, you know, and not just aligned with the, with the state or thinking politically, well, I've got to look tough on crime. I think they've really got to just let a little doubt creep in every once in a while and not be so robotic and just, you know, whatever the state does, they rubber stamp it. Have you ever considered becoming a judge? The judge I worked for really wanted me to do that. I really thought, you know, that I would be suited for it and that I would enjoy it. But I think the path I took has had a lot more influence than if I had been a judge in a particular, but I, but I know judges who've made remarkable decisions. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing. It's just a different path. I mean, and we really need judges, desperately need judges that, you know, have become attuned to the fact that people are wrongfully convicted and, you know, that you can't make these snap judgments. So, you know, it's just, I think it's a different path. But I've thought to myself, in so many of our cases, it's been so important who the judge is, that we've got someone who's listening, that has the right temperament, that loves what they're doing. I mean, I think nothing's better. I like to do bench trials on second, you know, when a case is reversed, I'm going to do a bench trial on a case in January because we've got a great judge and he's engaged in the process. I believe that we'll win. It isn't that he's favoring us, but he's really listening. It is the number one requirement of the job is to listen. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's a role and a position that has enormous power. It's just, you know, enormous power that you can be making life and death decisions. You know, one individual at the trial level because once people are convicted, it just sets in motion a whole view of the case that's so incredibly difficult. I mean, trial judges, yes, the Supreme Court's got power, but, but trial judges have just enormous power. Well, and so few cases get appealed. So really for 99% of the population, their vision of the justice system is based on that experience in that courtroom in front of that judge. You're exactly right. Yes, it's that, you know, it's tailored to that particular judge and his view of justice, his view of the evidence, his integrity. And it's all depending on that one person. Well, Kathleen, I must tell you, it's been a real thrill to meet you and to have this chat. Your high profile has done a lot to enhance the public image of the legal profession. And I personally am very gratified by that. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on our show. Oh, thank you. Well, I thought your questions were great. I thought they were very thought provoking. And, you know, I wish I could appear in a courtroom in front of you. <laughs> but I'm sure that you, you are somebody that's setting, you know, a standard for judges that you have this program, that you're exploring these issues. And that makes me feel a lot better about the justice system. Well, Kathleen Zellner, if you had stayed in Canada, we might have had that opportunity. <laughs> so please tell, your husband, please tell your husband, I'm not that happy that he took that job in the States. <laughs> thank I you, will. Thank you so, so much for being with us. Oh, it was wonderful. 
Our guest has been the brilliant attorney, Kathleen Zellner. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.